Before wildfires ignited across the North Bay, a number of small wineries in Napa County were already facing a challenge, sustaining business amid the pandemic. Our Michelle Griego spoke with two wine experts who say they're trying to look at the glass half full. It's a challenging situation for small wineries and grape growers, but amid this pandemic, some have no choice but to move forward and bond together. Joining me now by Zoom is Elise Rutchik of Save the Family Farms and Jason Elkin of Boomin Estate Vineyards. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for taking the time out to talk with us. Elise, I want to start by asking you, what is Save the Family Farms? Yes, hi Michelle. Um, so Napa is unique in that we have local legislation that says any wine producer wishing to host guests or sell wine from their farm must first build a winery. Um, <clears throat> the current application process is designed for facilities to process 20,000 gallons or more of wine. That's about 100,000 bottles. But there is a group of ultra small producers in Napa. We call ourselves micro wineries and we produce maybe around 50 barrels of wine or maybe 15,000 bottles total. And we just can't get through the current regulatory process. An application to build a micro winery in Napa does not exist. It leaves small family farms without any options. And uh, we are looking to change that. So we started a nonprofit called Save the Family Farms. And our mission is to keep small family farms viable for future generations in the Napa Valley. So obviously there are some challenges. The pandemic, of course, has presented a number of challenges from new guidelines to changing health mandates as well as the virus itself. So Jason, can you talk about how the pandemic is changing the way a small winery operates? Well, first of all, we already had like a massive feat ourselves to try to deal with in regards to competing in a very saturated industry. But due to the fact that we're limited to have direct to consumer sales, it puts us already in, 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 a, in a great deal of risk. Uh, but the limitations from COVID now due to no tourism uh, is uh, even you know, uh, more affected uh, to our situation. You know, a lot of people think or assume or feel that the industry is all in the same boat kind of together, but we are uh, affected differently because the mass production wineries or larger wineries that have distribution, they actually have, uh, when needing to lay off, uh, you know, employees, they still have distribution. Uh, for us, it's all direct to consumers. So what happens is, is if you, if you know, if anybody and all have been paying attention to the news, sales in um, beverage or adult beverage has gone up a great deal during COVID. So they've supplemented their loss in uh, profit by what's distributed on the shelf. Uh, they didn't have the overhead cost of employees like they had in the past. So they actually stayed consistent or actually possibly monetized even greater. Uh, for people like us, we're at risk of losing our entire business, our history, the uh, partnership and relationship and, that I have with Buman Estate Vineyards and Ranch. You know, they've been around since 1873. Families such as, you know, them and Elise, they have the potentials of actually losing their entire business. I mean, as you said, larger businesses and wineries, they have a better ability to stay afloat during this time. How are micro producers, how are they sustaining that business, especially in the present, pr presence of these larger wineries? So for myself, it's been complicated because we're limited to have direct to consumer sales. We're not allowed to host guests or customers at our location. There's no events. There's a, you know, nothing like that. We don't have great distribution outlets. You have to be creative. Like Elise was suggesting, you know, she does a lot of, uh, you know, virtual experiences such as that. Uh, you have to rely on, you know, trying to grow a club, but your case production is small. So even if you were to sell a majority of your wine, it's still, you know, the profits aren't necessarily that great. Uh, it's very limiting. It's really hard. Yeah, we've launched virtual tastings, uh, trying to bring our vineyard experience to people all over the country. We've been seeing some success with that. Uh, we also have a much heavier focus on email and social media, um, but we're figuring it out as we go. Like a lot of other small producers, there's certainly no substitute for the 4 million visitors that would come to the Napa Valley before COVID. So um, we're, we're just sort of living day by day. Um, and we're fighting to get our micro winery ordinance passed now. It's more important than ever because when the Napa Valley opens back up, we, the small family farmers, want to be able to participate in the economic recovery. Elise, talk more about the importance of that call to action to create the ordinance. Well, in the last several months, small producers like us, we've relied very heavily on restaurants, 
or big wine events to get out in front of the consumer. And since March, that channel has disappeared. So what you have happening is the small family farmer is being affected more than maybe the large producer. The large producer has access to the grocery store channel and many wine shops that are still open. But us small guys, um, we <laughs> were sort of without a way to access consumers through COVID. It's obviously a very uncertain time for so many people. What do you think lies ahead for small wineries in Napa County? You know, some of the costs uh, in our positioning with the production sizes we produce, it's just not realistic, you know. Um, it's, um, you know, there's, there's a very big difference and a gap in between, and that's what we're trying to kind of find a, a consistency in or a realistic opportunity to. So the current application process for a winery in Napa Valley costs about $5 million to start with and can go up to, I mean, I've heard some winery owners say they've invested $40 million to build their production facility. So it's just not accessible to the small family farmer. We are farmers first and foremost, and we don't have large margins. A lot of us don't come to Napa Valley with money. We've been in the Napa Valley for 40, 50, 60 years, and we're farmers. So we're working to create this micro winery ordinance so that we can preserve the small family farms in Napa Valley. Without some changes to the local legislation, the small family farmer will go extinct. What do you feel, and, and I guess I'll, I'll ask it again, and maybe at least you can, you can talk about this more, is so the ordinance gets passed, let's say, you know, what, what is going to happen with these micro wineries if it gets passed, if it doesn't get passed? This is pretty serious. If the micro winery ordinance does not get passed, the future for small family farms is very unknown. The wine tourism industry has evolved significantly over the last 20 years. And now the way you sell wine is direct to the consumer from the vineyard site. Small family farmers without production facilities on site are foreclosed from the opportunity to host guests on site and sell wine. So if we don't have a path to compliance, we have no way to sell our wine. And I mean, how long can a business stay alive without the ability to sell their products? Right. So then if this ordinance is passed, then this will really help out those uh, micro wineries to basically stay alive during this pandemic. And Michelle, it's also the ability to maintain and keep a history. A lot of these uh, families and bloodlines have been here, like the one I'm with and the partnership I have it has been here since the early 1800s. And they've sold grapes to the most prestigious, renowned, recognized wineries that everybody's heard of internationally. So a lot of the backstories and histories of the famous you know, Napa Valley have began with small family operated ranchers and farms and vintners such as ourselves, our backstories, our history. There's already been a couple hundred wineries and small lot producers and brands that have had to close and lose their histories of Napa Valley because of situations that we're all facing. If we can, uh, you know, pass these laws or get some kind of adoption rights to allow for us to just play in the game and be able to sell direct to consumer, we're not going to have a massive, uh, you know, huge outcome with our, our backstories, but we'll be able to maintain and the history will be able to remain in Napa Valley and grow. We'll be able to cover our costs and have a little bit of life. We're not gonna be huge you know, billionaires because of the outcome, but we won't go away. We won't be obsolete. The history will not be erased off the face of Napa Valley. Robert Mandavi once said something to the effect of, we are in competition with each other. We are not in competition against each other. So to me, that means that the wine industry as a whole, we are united by what we do. We are united by our sense of place and a rising tide lifts all boats. So I can't really identify any negatives to empowering Napa's smallest family farms and enabling Napa to be a place where small wineries can coexist next to these iconic huge wineries that have put Napa on the map. I'll send this question to both of you. Uh, what else do people need to know out there that they may not know and that is important to get across to them? 
Sure. So if I could just jump in really quick, you know, some of the, the campaign that we have active right now, uh, you know, getting recognition, getting signatures, getting support uh, for us to present in our packaging to try to get these adoptions, these rights passed is really important as well. A lot of these large wineries, they have really big marketing budgets and they have a presence in grocery stores around the country. And the small wine producers um, were not easy to find. So it's uh, maybe, why? Right, okay, we're not easy to find. So I would encourage people to dig a little deeper and try and identify and find these small family farms and support them because we need your support now more than ever in a post COVID world. Um, if you want to help Save the Family Farms, we have a website, savethefamilyfarms.com. It talks a lot about our mission, and we have three ways you can help on the website. You can sign our petition, you can consider making a modest donation, and we have some alternatives to sharing on social media. All right, Elise Rutchick of Save the Family Farms and Jason Elkin of Boomin Estate Vineyards, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. you.